In today's lecture, we'll evaluate the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Here's an overview of what we'll discuss. First, we'll introduce CEDAW's monitoring mechanisms, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We'll summarize some of the many achievements that CEDAW has seen. And then we'll spend most of our time analyzing some of the continuing obstacles and challenges to full implementation of the convention, focusing on two areas. First, gender discrimination in the cultural field, and second, reservations to CEDAW. Let's start by asking a basic question, which is does CEDAW adequately respond to the challenges of protecting the human rights of women and girls around the world? The answer to that question, I think it's fair to say, is that CEDAW and its monitoring mechanisms have indeed acted as a catalyst for eliminating inequality in many countries. But I think it's also fair to say that there are significant remaining obstacles, and we'll focus in particular on two, discrimination in the cultural sphere and also broad reservations to the treaty. To understand and appreciate what CEDAW has achieved, you need to know about its monitoring mechanism. As previously mentioned, all UN human rights conventions establish a treaty body of independent elected human rights experts to monitor implementation of that treaty by its state's parties. And the same is true for CEDAW. It establishes a committee on the elimination of discrimination against women and I've given you a link to the committee's website. As we'll discuss in more detail in week three of the course, the committee engages in a number of important activities. It reviews reports from states parties on the measures taken to implement the convention. It issues general recommendations uh, interpreting the rights and freedoms that CEDAW protects. It reviews complaints from individuals and non-governmental organizations alleging violations of CEDAW in specific cases, and it investigates gross or systemic violations of the treaty. More on this in week three. The CEDAW committee, through these processes, has gathered quite a bit of information about some of the positive steps that states' parties have undertaken in response to having ratified the convention. I've given you a number of examples here. Educational opportunities in Bangladesh, laws prohibiting violence against women in Mexico, uh, Kenya's uh, elimination of discrimination in inheritance rights, and the extension in Kuwait of political participation rights, voting rights, in response to a CEDAW committee recommendation in 2005. These are just some examples. Here are a few others. And as you can see, they range quite, quite broadly across not only civil and political rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights, and in the three spheres of the convention that we discussed in the previous lecture, the public sphere, the private sphere, and the cultural sphere. Now, I think it's fair to say, moving now from some of CEDAW's successes to some of its continuing challenges, that the cultural sphere has been especially challenging with respect to the eradication of discrimination against women. And that is because, as this slide indicates, many practices that are defended on the basis of, uh, of culture impinge on human rights in ways that are specific to women. And this uh, quote, which is from a member of the CEDAW committee, a former member of the CEDAW committee, indicates some of the ways in which discrimination in the cultural field persists. And for those of you who can recall the discussion of the first lecture on women's rights, on issues and challenges, you'll see there are quite uh, a few similarities to the quote from the article by professors Charlesworth and Chinkin with respect to violations of the right to life. Here you can see violations that are more broad, but they are also deeply embedded in the private and cultural sphere. Here are some additional examples, including violence against women, violations of human rights within the family, uh, violations relating to the right to food, and in general, violations that are based on 
ingrained conceptions of the inferiority of one sex in comparison to another. So these are some of the enduring challenges that CEDAW has faced and that it will face in the future. A second enduring challenge goes to the nature of the reservations that states have filed when ratifying the convention. Recall first from week one the definition of a reservation in Article 2 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I put that up on the slide as well. In essence, a reservation provides a mechanism for a state to carve out or opt out some of the obligations in a treaty that it has ratified. Now, we also discussed in week one that some treaties contain standards for measuring or evaluating the permissibility of reservations that states seek to file. And the CEDAW Convention is no exception. It does in fact contain a provision that says that reservations incompatible with the object and purpose of the convention are not permitted. That would seem to suggest that uh, reservations would be an exceptional uh, situation that some states might file with respect to a few practices, but not regularly or not with respect to many laws and policies. In fact, that is not the case. More than 60 of the uh, states parties to CEDAW, and remember there are 187 states parties at the present time, more than 60 states parties have filed at least one reservation to the convention, and more troublingly, many of these reservations are quite broad and they relate to core obligations to eliminate and prevent discrimination against women. Let me give you a few examples of these reservations and then we'll evaluate them. Here you see a reservation, which is an example of uh, one that is quite common to the treaty, and this is an, uh, a reservation based on Sharia or Islamic law. And a number of states' parties have uh, filed such reservations, either to the convention in general or to specific uh, provisions relating to discrimination in the family, in particular with regard to marriage, divorce, custody of children, adoption of children, and inheritance rights. And a quite broad example you see is the reservation from Saudi Arabia, which is a general reservation saying that in case of a contradiction between uh, the terms of CEDAW and the norms of uh, Islamic law, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is not under a legal obligation to observe the conflicting or contradictory terms of CEDAW. Extremely, uh, potentially extremely broad reservation. Another example of a broad reservation with a somewhat different objective uh, is a reservation with respect to uh, cultural practices and discrimination in the family. Here's an example you see of a reservation by India reserving to two clauses of the CEDAW Treaty uh, with regard to the conformity of India's policy of non-interference in the personal affairs of any religious community without its initiative or consent. And as you might imagine, this policy of non-interference does conflict with the obligation to eliminate discrimination in the cultural and social and private spheres. And here India is taking uh, a reservation that preserves the policies that it has adopted at the national level. A third example of a reservation uh, relates to the private sphere. Here you see a reservation by France which declares that the phrase a family education must be interpreted as meaning public education, that is education in public schools or in uh, outside of, of the home, concerning the family, and that Article 5 of CEDAW will be applied subject to respect for rights of privacy found in other human rights treaties. Here you see a reservation that limits the reach of the convention in the private sphere. France, by virtue of this reservation, declares that the word fa words family education must be interpreted as meaning public education, education in, in public schools principally, about the family, and that Article 5 of CEDAW will not be uh, applied in ways that interfere with 
the right to privacy that's found in other human rights treaties to which France is a party. And here, France is giving greater protection to privacy rights over CEDAW's obligation to states parties to promote gender equality with regard to family education. Now, with all of these broad reservations, one question that you might be asking is why? Why do we have so many of these reservations from uh, about a third or so of CEDAW states parties? Well, I think there are a number of answers to that question, and none of them are really definitive, but I think they're all worth thinking about and discussing. First, given the breadth of CEDAW's non-discrimination clause and the breadth of some of its obligations in the public, private, and cultural spheres, CEDAW is going to necessarily intersect with deeply held uh, national views and values relating to culture, society, and religion. In order to mediate those conflicting values or goals, a reservation is one way of proceeding. Another explanation for the large number of reservations to CEDAW is that states might need more time to implement, to the full extent, the expansive rights and obligations that the Convention contains. Recall that CEDAW cuts across civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, and that its definition of discrimination is quite broad. Under this view, or explanation, for why we see so many reservations, states would need additional time in order to fully implement their obligations under the treaty. A third explanation, which is, I suppose, a more cynical one, would be that states might want some of the benefits of joining the convention without making meaningful changes to their laws and practices. Stated another way, they might want to uh, be seen as a part of uh, the community of nations that accept in principle the idea of gender discrimination, but when it comes to the actual practice with uh, deeply held uh, national, religious, or cultural values, they're not willing to make changes. So these are three different explanations. They're not entirely mutually inconsistent, but they're different ways of trying to understand why the reservations exist. Now, there have been quite a few responses to the filing of these broad reservations, and I'd like to review a few of those with you before concluding the lecture. So first, a number of other states' parties to CEDAW, in particular states' parties uh, within Europe, have filed uh, objections to broad reservations in which they opine that the reservations are not compatible with the object and purpose of the convention. That's the standard for measuring reservations that we saw earlier. This is an official position by these objecting states, but the uh, legal effect of these objections is somewhat uncertain. In addition, the CEDAW committee, the monitoring body for the convention, has also taken steps to press states as to whether their reservations are really needed or necessary, and if they are needed, whether they're needed in, in a very broad form. This has led to a dialogue with a number of states' parties in which some have decided to withdraw or narrow reservations they had previously filed, thus expanding the scope of their obligations under the Convention. The CEDAW Committee has also made clear that two core provisions of the Convention, Articles 2 and 16, are provisions that are central to its object and purpose, and thus reservations to those provisions are not compatible with the treaty. For those of you who are interested in additional information about CEDAW and its reservations and related issues, I urge you to consult some of the sources that you see on this slide.